welcome you in a special way in our week of prayer, SAU week of prayer. Uh, that starts today to the 14th of April, 2022. I'm introducing our guest speaker for the week of prayer. We have Dr. Daniel Potabara. You'll forgive me? Yes, Potabara. Uh, he is the retired pastor, Central California Conference. We have a special guest from uh, Central California Conference. And beloved friends, at this time, we are now going to listen to uh, the special hymn that have been prepared. Then from, the, from there, the next voice that we'll hear is the voice of Dr. Daniel. So God bless you as you listen to his words and be revived in a special way. I thank you. I have a word to say. Um, I've been here for 16 years. It has taken me 16 years to sing a song here. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> last night I was full of regret as to why I ever thought of this thing. And I, I blamed Mrs. Lupondwana because I told her that, you know what, I want to sing, but then she threw it to Mko, and Mko published it. So I couldn't reverse. Um, just to warn you that if the song stops halfway, <laughs> don't worry. Now, the reason for this song <clears throat> is that I have this paper bag. I started my career with a paper bag as a literature evangelist. I used to carry my books in a paper bag. And um, I've sold books over the years. And I just want to thank the Lord that I have written my own books, Amen. And I thank the Lord for that. And by the grace of God, the first book I ever sold, I have it. When I came here <clears throat> as publishing director, I found this book. So I kept it. I started selling this book and the other one. 1986. I'm sure some of you were not yet born. <clears throat> so I want to sing. Where's my water? Okay. I'll sing all the way my Savior leads me. I'll sing one and the second stanza only. <clears throat> Savior leads me, whatever I to us beside, can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide, heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell, for I know to where thought thee dwell, for I know what had before me, Jesus to where thought things were. All the way my Savior leads me, chairs each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, fades me with a living breath. Though my weary steps by fault 
and my soul at this may be gushing from the rock before me lowest spring of joy I see gushing from the rock before me lowest spring of joy I see pray gentle shepherd come and lead us for we need you to help us find the way gentle shepherd my hope and prayer that uh, for the next uh, few days we can actually come closer to Jesus, our Savior, our Shepherd, as we try to learn more about Him. Okay. Um, the Shepherd Psalm, Psalm 23, is the favorite psalm in the world. I'm sure it is also your favorite. It is the favorite of the Jew the Roman Catholics, Western Protestants, Eastern Orthodox, Evangelicals, and even non-denominationals. I have been told that even agnostics love uh, the, the reading of the Shepherd Psalm, Psalm 23. Um, it comes alive when used in a wedding, more so in a funeral, or any of the other occasion. It can be used, just like uh, in Hawaii, they say aloha for, every, for everything. Uh, good morning is aloha, good evening, goodbye, farewell, welcome is aloha. Among the Jewish people, we have this shalom, uh, peace be with you, which means good morning, good evening, everything, they, they say it. The shepherd psalm can be used in every occasion, and it will actually come through to the heart of those reading it. And we'll try to find out why. I hope uh, we are able to find out why. Now, um, every time in the Old Testament we read the words, the Lord. In the Hebrew, the word is Yahweh. Um, it's a very interesting name of God, one of the most famous names of God. And when we trans translate the word Yahweh into English, it simply means He is. He is. Now, how did the name He is come to be, to be the name of God? Well, it actually started when Moses, after 40 years in the wilderness, met God in a burning bush. And in that burning bush, we know the story, God talked to him. First of all, God said, remove your sandals. The place you're standing on is holy ground. And then in their conversation, God told Moses that he was going to send him back to Egypt to actually deliver the Israelites from Egypt and from bondage. And in the course of their conversation, we know Moses did not want to go. He said he was slow of speech. Forty years in the wilderness being a shepherd, he had lost his being a statesman, 
when he was in Egypt. But the Lord assured him that he was going to be with him. And then Moses asked God, God, when I go to, e to, to Egypt and I begin talking to the Israelites, and they will know that you talked with me and I talked with you, they will ask me what your name is. What should I tell them? And we know what God, how God answered. My name is I am that I am. Isher, you are Isher in Hebrew. When Moses went to Egypt and the Israelites asked him, what is the name of God? Moses could not say that the name of God is I am because if he did, he would be saying that he, Moses, was God. So he said the name of God is he is, Yahweh. That's where we get that name. And so in Psalm 23, Yahweh is our shepherd. Now you'll notice that in Psalm 23, everything that David writes are all coming from God, assuring his readers and us how good God is. There is no call for repentance. There is no call for giving one's life to God. It's all about God, what God is doing and what he's providing. And that is because in the preceding chapter, chapter 22, we see David pleading with God. He even, that what he was saying in Psalm 22 were actually things that became a prediction of what Jesus would be saying on the cross. Why have you forsaken me? My enemies are surrounding me. I am in trouble. I am in danger. And at the end of Psalm 20, 22, David assures his readers that God listens to all, everyone who calls for help. And so when he goes to 23, there was nothing else in his mind except the goodness of God after in chapter 22, he pleaded for God. Let's go back to the name he is. I am. Jesus said one time when he was asked, you're not even 30 years old and you know Abraham? What did Jesus say? Before Abraham was, I am. The Bible also says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the name he is coming from I am means that God is always in the present time. He's never in the past, never in the future. Everything for him is in the present, which means for me and for us that my past is present with God, with Yahweh. My, pre my present time is, of course, present with him. My future is also present with Yahweh. He can take care of all of my needs, all of our needs, past, present, and future. We live in time, but God does not. Uh, Albert Einstein, in his uh, theory of relativity, said that if anyone can be in a spaceship and travel at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, once he reaches that speed, all of that person's time is compressed into the now. His past will become now for him. His present, his future becomes now for him. Now, of course, no human being can do that because according to geologists, once you, once you approach the speed of light, matter grows out in geo geometric proportion until infinity. And so no hum human being can do that. But if anybody can do that, Albert Einstein says in his theory, time will be compressed and he will be in the now. Now who is the only person in the universe who can travel the speed of light? Of course, God doesn't even have to travel that speed because by nature, he is I am. He is, he is. Commentators are telling us that when the ancient Israelites, as they were journeying all of their lives from Egypt until the promised land, 
that every time they read Psalm 23, they did not even finish the whole chapter. Just by the fact of reading Yahweh is my shepherd, they would just conclude, I shall not be in want. Because for them, it was enough to know that Yahweh is always in the present time. Their past is present with him. Their future was present with him. And that's the kind of God we serve. Now, David uses the analogy of the sheep being taken care of the shepherd when he refers to Christians like us. And some commentators are saying that the analogy of calling Christians, believers, as sheep is not a compliment. It's actually some kind of a rebuke of, or an insult. Because experts tell us that sheep are the dumbest animals in the world. The sheep doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know where he's going. He doesn't know where to find food. That's why all his life, the sheep has to follow the shepherd. And the shepherd had to supply all of his needs. As we go through the shepherd's psalm, we'll know that in every need of the sheep, the shepherd provides. Otherwise, the shepherd is helpless. Also, when the sheep is lost, it is lost. It cannot find its way back to the fold. One commentator I read said that sheep become uncomfortable when there's some kind of a problem among the fold. And using the parable of the lost sheep, according to this commentator, he said that the reason why the shepherd leaves the 99 in the fold and looks for the one lost sheep was because the fold, the 99, could not be at ease. They could not sleep and rest until their calling is found. Now, that's a strange interpretation, but I think there's some kind of an, a truth in that. Because we as Christians, we have to know that as sheep, we are totally dependent upon our shepherd. I heard a story about uh, George Bush, the older George Bush, who became president of the United States. Um, one time, they were traveling in a convoy, campaigning for his re-election, which he eventually lost to uh, Bill Clinton. But on their way, they found themselves in Texas, and they were going the back roads because they were visiting smaller towns that they were campaigning to. And after a few moments, the driver of the limousine, the presidential limousine, said, Mr. President, we're running low on gas, and we're in the middle of nowhere. Where are we going to find gas? Barbara, the wife, said, oh, don't worry. I know this place. I grew up in this place. A few miles from now, you turn to the left, and you will find at the end of that rugged road, there's a service station we can fill up right there. And so they were happy. They went and found the, the gas station, and uh, the attendant came out and began to fill. Barbara said, honey, uh, let me go out. I know this guy. Just want to greet her, greet him. And so she, she went out. Uh, Secret Service surrounded her as she went to this guy filling up their car, and she gave him a hug, and they talked for a little while. And when the, when the car was filled up, she went back into the car, and they began driving again. And the president said, who was that? Well, honey, that was my childhood sweetheart. We grew up in this place. And George Bush, according to the story, said, wow, you are married to the most powerful man in the world. If you didn't meet me, you would have been married to a gas station attendant. And according to the story, Barbara said, don't be silly, George. If I married him, he'd be president. <laughs> I really don't know if that story is true. But I think we can get some lesson out of that. You see, the Christian, we as Christians, we're tempted to think that because of our 
experience, our education, our skills, and how the Lord has used us in many, many ways. 44 years in the ministry, in denominational ministry. We think, I have the tendency to think that I am a self-made man. That's a motto of every American. I am a self-made man. I am successful because of what I did, my efforts, my sacrifices. And sometimes we're tempted to think that because of that, we don't need anything, at least subconsciously. Psalm 23, 23 tells us we need everything. The shepherd is there, and without the shepherd, we're helpless. And that is why Psalm 23 is so important for us to understand. Now let's go to the first three chapters and then we'll end. I know that this is a working day and uh, I'm not going to keep you long. And if you think I'm speaking longer than I should, uh, just pull the plug on the trap door and I'll fall down and I know I have to stop. Okay, is there a trap door here? Okay, <laughs> sometimes they put it in a way you don't see it. <laughs> anyway, verse one. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. When the sheep can lie down on its food, that means that it had eaten enough and is satisfied. Mm. Lying down on green, it is not dried pasture, green, fresh pasture means it had eaten to its content, and therefore it can take a nap. And I, I don't know with you, but for me, the best way to take a nap is not before meals, but after meals, right? Usually after lunch, best way to take a nap. And, and when the sheep can lie down on its food, it has abundance of food. The sheep needed that. The shepherd provided it. And using that analogy, for us Christians, there's always enough food for us. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4 says, when Jesus was being tempted by the devil, turn these stones into bread. You've been hungry for 40 days. Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And so when we go further from Psalm 23 to Psalm 37, verse 25, David said, I was young and now I'm old, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his children begging bread. You know, personally, I can truly relate to those words. I was young and now I don't want to say it. I'm older, <laughs> retired. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his children begging bread. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And then he leads me beside still waters. People who know sheep, they, they tell us that sheep hate tur turbulent, noisy waters. It needs to be in still quiet waters because especially when the sheep has actually have more or, or, or all of these fleas that it has and it, if, if it goes into turbulent waters it can actually get caught by caught up by by the current and it can drown because the fleas will actually absorb all the water and the sheep will drown. It cannot swim anymore. So it loves still quiet waters. Shepherd brings it there. The analogy for us Christians is that the Lord provides for us the living water that we need every day. If the sheep needed still waters, quiet waters to, to drink and to bathe in, we Christians can enjoy Jesus, the water of life that he provides for all of us so that we can never be thirsty. Uh, in the story of Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman by Jacob's well, we know the story. 
after Jesus talked, or they stopped right there, because Jesus, they were all hungry. The disciples and Jesus were hungry. And Jesus stayed by the well, and he, he went, and they went to the town to get some more food. The, the Samaritan woman comes and converses with Jesus. Interesting conversation. And then, when the woman went back to town to tell everyone in town about the Messiah that she has finally found out, the disciples came, offered Jesus food, and what did Jesus say? Not hungry. I'm not hungry. And they were sad. Did anybody give him food while we were away? He was hungry before we went to town. And Jesus said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. When we do the will of the one who sends us, when we do the will of Yahweh the shepherd, we won't even feel hungry for physical food. Of course, we have to eat eventually. But the Lord provides water, water of life. And then the Lord says, and David says, he restores my soul. The three most basic need of human beings physically, food, water, and rest. When all of these three are put together in a balanced way, there is the potential for good health. And in a Christian way, we need to understand that we also need the rest from the Lord. Amen. How does the Lord take care or give us rest? I'd like to spend a few minutes in trying to deal with that. And then we'll go to the last point of our topic for today. <clears throat> when I said earlier that Yahweh takes care of all of our needs, past, present, and future, we ask, what about the past? The past is past. Let bygones be bygones. Mm -hmm. Are there needs that we have in the past that need to be taken care of? I praise the Lord if all of us can say none. The past is past. But we know every day, just listening to the news, especially from the country I came from, that there are many people who are so troubled at the present time. Not because they're not intelligent, not because they are not able to do things with their own knowledge, not because they're not smart enough, but just because something happened to them in the past that keeps bothering them. Now we know about child abuse, children who've been abused when they were children, people who had made wrong choices when they were younger, and the guilt of what they did continues to haunt them. And when they could not handle it, when they don't get the help that they need, they snap. They go back to where they worked. We, we've heard about this. And they kill people there. Or they kill the whole family. And then they shoot themselves. These things take place because there were needs that were not taken care of in the past. How does Yahweh take care of those? Well, two things, two ways. If we have done something because of our wrong choices in the past that keep bothering us, God forgives. He resets the button of our computers, so to speak. And when God forgives, He forgets. We forgive but unless we have dementia or Alzheimer's, we don't forget, right? And for me, the, the, the sweetness of forgiveness is in the fact that we don't forget. But when God forgives, he forgets. Three passages in the Bible, two in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, tell us that he forgives. In one passage, he says, I will I will." take your transgressions and bury them in the deepest parts of the sea. In another passage, he says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed my transgressions from us. And in Hebrews chapter 8, he says, I will forgive their sins and remember them no more. You know, in, in 1 John 1, 9, it's a very important passage for me. Because there are some people who confess their sins 
and still feel that they could not be forgiven. Um, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The assurance and guarantee of our forgiveness is not in how we feel. It's not in our minds. It is in God's faithfulness and justice. If we can just depend on that and leave everything to God, no matter how we feel, then we can know that we're forgiven. Now, secondly, if what happened to us in the past were done by other people, in some cases we know that children who've been abused were abused by relatives, in some cases even a parent, then as Christians we should know that we should forgive. Why should we forgive? It is because we had been forgiven much. The parable of the unforgiving servant tells us that this servant, he was a chief servant who owed the master a lot of money, was forgiven. But when another servant, a, a, a younger servant, who owed him very few money, wanted to be forgiven, he would not forgive. So we should forgive because we have been forgiven much. And we can elaborate on that. That's another sermon, but I think it's, it's just enough for us to know now. And secondly, when we forgive, we are the very first ones who benefit from the forgiveness. All the bitterness and the grudge that we keep, while we look, we keep going back to the time when somebody abused us, we, they will all be gone when we forgive. Psychologists tell us that there's lots of benefits. We don't have time to look at each one of them. Low blood pressure, uh, higher immune system, when we forgive. Just and, and those psychologists who say that are not necessarily Christians. And so that's how Yahweh provides for us rest. Now lastly, he says, he leads, he guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Why does Yahweh guide us in paths of righteousness? For the sheep, it's the right paths. Uh, the shepherd guides the sheep in the right path so that it doesn't stumble or fall into the ditch or, or uh, places where there's can, there can be dang dangers. For the Christian, he guides us in paths of righteousness because the Bible is clear. Galatians and Romans, we don't have righteousness. Righteousness is not inherent in us. In fact, the Old Testament tells us in Isaiah, our righteousness are like filthy rags, not acceptable to God at all. You see, we human beings, we call some people good people, and some people not so good, some people bad. But when we say a person is good or bad, it's a very relative statement because we call a person good when we know he or she had done some benefits for us or, or other people that we know. And people who have not done anything good for us or maybe have done something wrong to us, we call them bad. I've been a teacher for nine years before I accepted a call to North America Division. And some students called me a good teacher. Why do you think? They got good grades. And those, st those students who did not get, get as good grades as others called me a very bad teacher. <laughs> so it's relative. Goodness and righteousness are not inherent in the human being. We need to be led, guided into righteousness. Um, psychologists again tell us that all human beings have two needs. The felt needs and the real needs. The felt needs for the secular person are a place to stay, roof above his head, food, shelter, um, the assurance of safety. But the real need would be accomplishment, achievement, the feeling of being able to contribute something to society. For the Christian, 
The real need is righteousness. That's what we need. Our real need is Jesus. We have the same felt needs as other people, but the Christian needs righteousness more than anything else. Because we don't have righteousness, we have to be guided. And I think that is the best part of what David is saying about Yahweh providing needs. And so all our needs supplied because Yahweh is our shepherd. There's nothing that we need that he would not supply. Let me close with a story. I've heard several versions of this story. The one I'm going to tell you, the version is the best that, uh, for me. Okay? There was a fundraiser in Hollywood, in California. And uh, famous rich people, actors and actresses were invited into that uh, fundraiser. And it was done in a big mansion of uh, one of the most famous people at that time in, in California. And uh, in the midst of all of these guests were two important people. One was an old minister, and the other one was a very famous actor. Now, the host was a Christian. And at the end, when, when the goal was reached, and uh, all the pledges and all the donations had been given, and it was time to dismiss, he requested the two, import, the two people, the actor and the minister, to recite the shepherd's psalm because he was a Christian. And, and so the actor came to the podium and he began reciting the shepherd's psalm start to finish. He did it with all his, his dramatic skills, with the way he, he fluctuated his voice just to show how, how passionate he was in reciting it. When he was done, Everybody stood up, cheered, and gave him a standing ovation. They were so impressed by his performance of reciting the shepherd's psalm. Then the old minister came, and in his, so, in his soft, humble voice, recited the shepherd's psalm start to finish. When he was done, nobody stood up, nobody applauded, nobody cheered. But almost everyone had tears rolling down his cheek. They were so touched by his performance. And as the guests were getting out and the host was saying goodbye to them by the door, when the actor came, the host said, Sir, what do you think was the difference between your reciting of the shepherd's psalm and the pastor's reciting? And the actor got it right. He said, I know the shepherd's son. He knows the shepherd. Do we know the shepherd? I think we do. Let's make him the most important person in our lives every day. And we'll be okay. This is my prayer for everyone. Amen. Amen. Relevo a Christi Jesu, hore fa monyetla wa hore hopotsa hore wena o modisa wa sebeli o modisa ya re hlokomelang kana go tsohle re di nkutse sa tsebeng le hore di ja eng di ja kae di tsama ya ho kae empa ka mo ha wa hao o rutwetse bohloko wa re shebela pele wa bona ho lukile hore wena o tlo o be modisa wa rona o be mohlokomedi wa rona ka na go tsohle re ya ho leboha Jesu ke na le rona le tsatseng lena o re fe khotso re fe matla o re fe botshepehe mo sebetseng wa hao re leboha lentswe la hao re leboha le mo mo bui wa lona e le moruti hore a tle a dumele ho sebediswa ko wena ho rona mo hlonolo fatsele lapala hae Kali bitula Jesu Amen. Amen.